just have to wait until after the test. I feel weird starting this video because, like, everyone knows Half-Life, right? Do I really need to do the big thing where I talk like, oh, oh, you know, Half-Life is one of the greatest games of all time, you know, it revolutionized video games for years to come. It put Valve on the map and showcased how to do storytelling diegetically throughout the experience. Like, come on, you've probably heard, like, 50 other YouTubers talk like that, and I'm not dissing them. So instead, let me do something unique and discuss my own personal opinions and experiences with Half-Life. The original game is probably one of my favorite games of all time. It's the type of game that I could just pick up whenever I'm feeling down or need some comfort and just blast through it in a weekend. Originally, I'd found out about the game not from growing up in the 90s and seeing it in a magazine as a kid like all you gamers did, but instead through watching Freeman's Mind. So it's probably fair for me to say I've played through Half-Life at least a dozen times. Originally, it was through an old CD copy I got for my, I think, 10th birthday with Opposing Force. And then when I finally got Steve, in 2011, I used that to play Blue Shift. Yeah, the first game that I ever got on Steam was Blue Shift. And just real quick, I just want to say that Blue Shift is just not as bad as people say. And Half-Life 2 Episode 1 is just way fucking worse. It really bothers me that people hate on Blue Shift and everyone loves Opposing Force. And I mean, it's, it's not as good as Opposing Force, but Half-Life 2 Episode 1 is way worse and it sucks because... Now, the reason I'm bringing this all up is just to showcase how much I really do love the franchise and how that love really seems to peak for me with the first game. And it has been a large part of my life since I was a little baby bitch. And during those, you know, turbulent times, I remember fucking freaking out when I saw the trailer to Black Mesa back in the day. It looked absolutely unreal. A mod built from the ground up that completely remakes the entirety of Half-Life in the Source engine. And this wasn't just a simple port job like the official Half-Life source which sucks ass it instead completely reimagines large areas of the game to fit the newer style that the series began to adopt so of course on september 12th 2012 i finally was able to play the game and i fucking loved it I loved it so much that I actually bought the soundtrack because I genuinely felt bad that a game with this much love and support put into it was free. It was a magical experience playing Black Mesa for the first time, but obviously something was missing. Zen. Zen is the black sheep of the entire franchise. And let me just put this out there, right here, right now, no tomfoolery, no, no lollygagging. Zen fucking sucks ass in the original Half-Life. If any of you out there thought I was going to be some freakazoid zen apologist, then I'm sorry, but I'm not that much of a virgin, okay? I'm not that much. Zen takes everything that sucks about base Half-Life and combines it into one of the shittiest areas in any FPS I've ever played. It's got it all. A confusing as fuck layout, terrible new enemies, little to no atmosphere, and two of the most underwhelming boss fights I've ever seen. It just sucks. But I'm not really breaking new ground here. Everyone thinks Zen sucks. And if you don't, then get the fuck out of here! <laughs> it's like imagining being like that upset that someone likes Zen. <laughs> so of course, the team behind Black Mesa, Crowbar Collective, they knew this. They knew it better than any of us. They knew that Zen couldn't receive just a facelift with a few minor tweaks to the level design and that's it. No. no. It needed to be completely reworked and remade from the ground up as its own original thing. Designed to be tighter, faster, more exciting than the Zen we knew and loathed. I mean, think about it from a story perspective. Gordon Freeman is being teleported light years away to fight an eldritch god that enslaved an entire species. That's fucking sick! And that's why they delayed it. And on December 24th, 2019, a whole seven years after the mod first released, we got Black Mesa Zen. Now, okay, 
Sorry about this, but before we talk about Zen in extensive detail, I really do need to give my thoughts on the base game of Black Mesa. The reason I'm doing this, spoiling the video a bit, is that I personally think that Black Mesa Zen is much better than base Black Mesa, which is entirely due to the lessons they learned while making the original mod. Without them learning and experimenting in the base game, Zen wouldn't be as weird or unique as it is now. Black Mesa is a great remake that showcases exactly what talented fans with passion can accomplish with enough hard work and determination. With that said, however, I don't think it fully replaces the original game. Now, don't get me wrong, there is so much to love and enjoy here, but it isn't perfect. So with that said, let's start with all the things I love about this remake. I've played through this game maybe five or six times now throughout the years, and every single playthrough, I always find something new to love. The new amount of attention to detail in some of these areas is staggering. For example, this part with the sniper in surface tension is fucking brilliant. You're round the corner avoiding mines and see a guard get shot by the sniper above. The scientist with him sees this and panics, trying to run away from the sniper before also getting shot and killed. This new set piece is already a really great way to diegetically and naturally introduce the snipers into this section of the game. But the game also adds a nice little hidden element of interactivity here that I did didn't know about until this playthrough. So while playing through this segment for this video, I wondered how this would play out if I messed with the scripting a tiny bit, so I reloaded my save and instantly killed the sniper after he shot the guard. This is so fucking cool! It feels like something out of an immersive sim! What a shame. This new attention to detail is probably the first thing that will jump out to any veteran of the Half-Life series. The opening is completely redone with all new dialogue from the scientists that makes the facility feel alive, with real human beings working there and not just robots repeating the same three lines over and over again. Look out, Freeman! Freeman, you fool! I hope you know what you're doing. Freeman, you fool! Why do they have to make us wear these ridiculous ties? Freeman! You fool! Animations especially have been given so much new life into them. The way the Black Ops agents move now is just fucking gorgeous. All the gun animations feel weighty and impactful. And of course, how could you forget the new Hive Hand animation? Oh. The moment where I feel this detail is most evident, though, is through the chapter Questionable Ethics. This entire chapter in the original game is to show how Black Mesa had been in contact with the border world in secret and had been conducting ethically questionable experiments on the wildlife. In the original game, this is all a little abstract and kind of hard to follow, but here they show it masterfully. You could see little alien habitats filled with the fauna of Zen where the scientists studied them, and every single whiteboard around the room has information and data on the aliens being studied. You actually learn stuff about these aliens and understand that the resonance cascade was only a matter of time. Now, I could talk about the amazing revamped visuals, stellar sound design, or even how the gunplay now actually doesn't feel like hot garbage, but I'll save all that for when we talk about Zen. Instead, we need to talk about the biggest lesson that was taken from Half-Life and incorporated perfectly into both the base game and, by extension, Zen the set pieces. If you don't know what a video game set piece is, it can best be described as a sometimes scripted event that allows the player to experience something new and exciting. A perfect example from another game would be the ending runs of Halo Comet Evolved and Halo 3. I adore how Black Mesa handles its set pieces because they take what was originally in Half-Life and makes it just like that much more exciting. The modern set pieces in Black Mesa give off the same feeling of wonder and excitement that I felt back in the day playing Half-Life for the first time, you know, on that little like CD-ROM thing. A great example of what I'm talking about here is the set piece at the beginning of Power Up. The original game introduces the Gargantua by having the player watch defeat a bunch of HECU soldiers. It is a nice change of pace as this is the first time that you actually see the soldiers attack an alien, while also showcasing that this thing is a fucking menace. In Black Mesa, they take this set piece and crank it up to 11 though by adding in all new excellent atmosphere and showing the gargantua actually knocking out the power which is a nice subtle way of showing the player their next objective for this area and the thing is black mesa also takes it one step further and adds all new set pieces that never existed in the original game things like a whole new fight at the dam a new ambush within forget about freeman and of course the ambush at the end of questionable ethics and i want to single out that last one for a minute because i think it damn well may be one of my favorite set pieces in any FPS I've ever played. And I played Entropy Year Zero, goddammit! You see the fucking explosives in that thing? I got an idea, I got an idea, I got an idea, I got an idea. 
<laughs> At the end of questionable ethics, you have to escort three scientists back to the lobby of the Lambda Lab. On the way there, you hear one of the scientists say that they have a bad feeling about the room ahead and ask you to scope it out while they stay behind. Anyone else think this was a bit too easy? Something's not right. Gordon, you don't mind taking a look, do you? So, you walk through the door, and this happens. Soldiers begin to flank you from all sides, catching you in an ambush. They pull out every fucking trick in the book here. They blast open doors, repel from the ceiling, snipe you from up above, and you have to use every tool at your disposal to get rid of them. And of course, the best part is you have Joel Nielsen blasting the fucking best song you've ever heard straight into your goddamn dome piece. It's a set piece so good that the first time I played through it, I legit had to take a breath afterwards because of how much it blew me away. And that right there is what Black Mesa is to me at a core level. It is everything from the original Half-Life, but dialed up to 11 in visuals, audio, level design, and set pieces. However, that's not always a good thing. And this is where my major complaints come in, mainly due to the fact that sometimes, you know, less is more. The original game's level design had a strange, I don't know, charm to it with some of these rooms. One of my favorites from the early game is, of course, the box smashing room. It's this giant blast room with crates suspended over a bottomless pit. There's no way to exit this room without jumping on top of the crates. And the best part is, you get to the end of the cargo lift and you find out that they were shipping these crates to literally an empty room. And I love that! I think that's great! As the game game says, work harder, not smarter. Now, Black Mesa has the same room, but they over-designed it. The original game just wanted a strange platforming challenge that would fit an evil science facility, and Team Crowbar wanted to take that same idea and have it make logical sense. The problem I have with this is it completely ruins the vibe the original game had. I I don't really know how to put it in better words. It's a vibe. By making these areas make more logical sense, it makes the world feel less interesting to explore. Because whether you like it or not, Half-Life is fucking silly. The dimensional breach is and I find it way funnier imagining the heads of Black Mesa designing a box smashing room suspended over a bottomless pit than the more realistic and boring solution they came up with in the game. They do this sort of thing with a lot of areas in the game, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. Even worse, sometimes it actively ruins the gameplay in some of these areas. For example, due to the revamped level design and surface tension, they completely fucking ruined the modern Major General fight! You can't weave in and out of gunfire like you could in the original game. Like, like you, you know, remember crawling through those little foxholes? It was great! It really is give and take with this mod sometimes, and it really highlights the fact that I wish this dev team wasn't constrained to just remaking a pre-existing great game, and instead given the freedom to do new and weird stuff. But, like I said, that's Black Mesa, for better or for worse. It really does seem like Black Mesa is trying new and exciting things, like its set piece at the end of Questionable Ethics, but it's having a hard time breaking free of the constraints of this being a remake of Half-Life 1. And you know, you know, I'm doing a little bit of a thought experiment here, but if only there was a section of Half-Life that was just, you know, so universally hated, so absolutely reviled, that no one would care if they completely threw out the Half-Life playbook and made something completely new and unlike anything that has ever been seen in this franchise before or even since. <laughs> Thank you.
I feel like that new intro into Zen really tells you everything you need to know about the journey ahead. This ain't your grandpa's Zen. This is a whole ass new experience. You know, I've taken like over a week to just script out and write this next segment because Zen just overwhelms you with its first impressions. Walking out of the teleporter, you just get greeted with this insane combination of visuals and sounds that unabashedly tells you that you're in for some cool shit. I remember the first time playing this without knowing anything about the new Zen and just experiencing this and getting just insane chills. This fucking game understands how to create good atmosphere. For starters, I love how they took a page from Half-Life 2's playbook and have your goal always looming in the distance. The portal to Nihila Nihiloth's Nihila. I'm gonna say Nihiloth uh, for the rest of this video and just go with it. The portal to Nihiloth's lair is always watching you from afar, and over the next few hours, you see it grow larger and larger as you get closer to your ultimate goal. It really is just ripped straight from Half-Life 2, but I mean, everyone fucking loves the Citadel, so I'm not really complaining. But, uh, but anyways, we'll touch more on that in the future. The other thing that is just so striking to me about this introduction is how much the developers made Zen feel like a true alien ecosystem. Zen in the original Half-Life was frankly a shithole. It was just a bunch of small floating rocks in the middle of nowhere, and it never left the player any idea on how exactly the aliens live. I mean, there were a few small areas where they tried to have a living, breathing ecosystem, but those sections were always either criminally short or just plain underwhelming. In Black Mesa, however, you get the complete scope on how these creatures live and interact with their environment. There are a fuck ton of completely new assets and models that were made for Zen specifically, and it helps to make the whole place feel just alive. But the thing I love about it most is that it still feels fucking alien. Take these flowers for example. Later on in the chapter, there is this giant tree with these massive leaves connected with giant roots growing out of them. But as you get closer, I'm unsure whether these actually are roots or industrial pipes. It seems like they are maybe having some sort of energy drained out of them, maybe to be used as supplies for the war on Earth. Or possibly that is just how these leaves normally are and it looks strange to us. It's incredibly unclear. So you follow these roots or pipes or whatever they are all the way to the end and find this weird tendril heart thing that seems to be alive on its own. So you shoot and kill it, which has the leaves open up and reveal the path forward. But wait, what the fuck did I just shoot? Was it an invention from Nihiloth to suck up the energy from the tree? Or are we literally just killing the plants to move forwards? I have no idea and I love that! I fucking love being ignorant! I mean, just think about how many alien worlds in movies and games mirror our own through an obvious lack of creativity. Zen and its ecosystem are truly unique and mysterious to us, which led my mind to wander off and try to make sense of the strange world I'm exploring all the fucking time. And of course, this level of environmental detail and storytelling doesn't stop there. Building upon what Black Mesa already established in the base game with questionable ethics, you can now find the remnants of multiple scientific expeditions all over Zen. You find gear like these new scanners, scaffoldings, and small construction sites where the scientists were expanding their home base, which leads you to the research lab. I fucking love the research lab especially, as it has so many tiny details that I adore, while also returning the survival horror atmosphere from the beginning of the game. This especially can be seen with the new HEV zombies, which are an excellent new addition. You can hear the robotic voice malfunctioning and freaking out, And since they are wearing HEV suits, they are a lot more durable. There's still chumps though. A fucking double shot from the Spaz 12 takes them down like nothing. I mean, just, just listen to the meat of this gun. I love the Spaz 12 in this game. You have no idea. The classic whiteboards are also back with new fun tidbits of lore and information. My favorite one is this makeshift little habitat the scientists made where they all have votes on different names for the aliens. There's also a nice little lore detail that they added specifically into this game with how the HEV suit charges. In the original game, I honestly just assumed that it ran on normal battery power, especially when you see what looks like car batteries scattered around the facility. Facility? Oh, my throat's going. However, while walking around Zen, you can find these giant blue crystals that shoot out electricity when you get near them, and they charge the suit. Then, when you get into the lab, you can see they were actually studying these crystals and thinking of ways to use them as a power source. So then, diegetically through the game's world, you as the player can come to the conclusion that the scientists were able to harness the power of these crystals to power your suit. And that is why the HEV suit is so strong. Ah! Ah! 
I swear the little details in these levels are so goddamn impressive, and we are still not done talking about this first chapter. I mean, shit, I could complete the Zen chapter in the original Half-Life 1 in like three goddamn minutes, but there are so many new things added here. There are new enemies like these barnacles that suck you up from under the water, or Mr. Burns, a giant hopper that has armor around its body. The game also constantly surprises the player with supply drops sent to you from the scientists in the Lambda Lab, making them actually useful on your mission. The cherry on top is that some of these supply drops actually hold little messages that motivate the player to keep going as you get closer to your goal. It's stuff like this that shows how much Crowbar Collective actually cares about the little details, and I don't think- I, have I said that they care about the little details enough of this fucking script? Do you get it yet? Do you get it? So, okay, full disclosure about the behind the scenes process for this video. I don't, I don't know why, but I'm very proud of the fact that I wrote down notes while playing through the main game to make my time writing the script much easier. I'm a lazy motherfucker, so that should tell you a lot about how much I love this game. The paper's also wet and soggy. I, I, I don't, I don't, this is not a bit, I don't know why it's wet and soggy. Just look at how much I jotted down for this chapter alone, compared to the entirety of the base game. There's just so much to talk about with this opening Zen chapter that it's fucking overwhelming. Luckily for me and my gamer arthritis ridden wrist, we are nearing the end of this first chapter to Zen, which ends with a really cool new puzzle section where you have to repair the teleporter to Gonarch's Lair. Gonarch's Lair in the original game was basically just a boss arena and a very lackluster one at that. You chase Gonarch through three individual areas, with each arena getting smaller and smaller as you go along. The main strategy to deal with Gonarch is to just dump all your ammo into her without much thought or critical thinking until she either runs away or dies. It's a mostly inoffensive fight, but for the mother of all head crabs, it's so fucking weak. The potential is there for something way cooler and interesting than what we got here. And of course, Black Mesa delivers on that front, and then some. Okay, so they added a nice little opening yeah. cutscene to this fight, but it really is just the same as before. You jump around this giant arena and unload almost all your ammo into Gonark until she runs away. So of course, like normal, you run after her, expecting to meet in the next boss arena until this happens. I'm not gonna lie, this got my ass the first time playing this. Instead of having the same mediocre fight as before, they decided to change the Gonarch fight into a whole ass level. Yeah! Yeah, that's so fucking cool! <laughs> Just fucking turned into like a monkey. Ooh, ooh. This whole level gives my sweet little baby girl the spectacle and respect she deserves. So while the visuals and environmental challenges are more of the same for Black Mesa, now you have to explore with the constant threat of Gonark showing up and beating the freaking heck out of you. She doesn't work like a Mr. X sort of enemy where she is constantly following you, more so that there are specific areas that are predetermined to have her chase you. It doesn't make her any less scary though. This section is so good because it really does show just how powerful of a creature Gonark really is, and how helpless you are in this situation. It genuinely feels like you are being hunted by a real wild animal. And that's basically most of this level. Solving puzzles and platforming during the quiet time, and then loud and bombastic chase sequences thrown in every few minutes to catch you off guard. Sometimes you have to jump over large caverns to get away from her, other times you fucking bonk her on the head with a giant rock. <laughs> That's uh, staying in. One of the coolest moments is here where you see that Gonark actually lays out a trap for the player to get stuck in. It's a really neat moment that shows you that the alien you were fighting against has a higher form of intelligence than you thought, and you should not underestimate her. And okay, fine. This seems like a good enough time to acknowledge the giant elephant in the room. You know, big, big fucking Dumbo over here. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. So the original Black Mesa already had an incredible soundtrack, 
Like I mentioned earlier, it was so good that back in 2012 with my mother's credit card, I actually purchased it because I wanted to support the devs, but also because I genuinely loved every new track that was added. So of course, after nine years, you know, fucking Jolly Joel over here, used that time to cook up some insane tracks for these final chapters of the game. I have been using his music for the majority of the time we've talked about Zen, so if you have felt like my video has seemed a bit more classy than normal, I don't know why you would think that, but it's all because of his music. I am of the personal belief that music can be one of the most important parts of a game, because even if said game has an incredible story or gameplay, the music is what helps you reconnect back to the game long after you finished it. Hell, while typing all of this out, I'm re-listening to the soundtrack of Zen so it can help me get in the right mindset while writing some of these segments. Music can immerse you so heavily in a game that it makes you personally feel the impact of what is happening. And that's what all of Joel's tracks do for the entirety of Gonark's Lair. And of course, the rest of Black Mesa. The moments where you're being chased by her have this intense but almost majestic music playing in the background. Music that is saying you are being chased by a wild animal in her home. Fucking run. It is so damn good, and a large part of that is due to these amazing female vocals in the background. Her performance is honestly a large part of why I like these tracks so much, as it has a small bit of hopefulness to these tracks that are so alien and intense. I honestly want to credit her for her work in the soundtrack, but that's not as easy as you'd think. The credits for the music only say Joel Nielsen, and there is no other section that mentions the vocal performance. I did some digging and couldn't find her name anywhere on Joel's website, Bandcamp, or even the official soundtrack. So of course I did a little bit of digging, I did a little bit of cyber sleuthing, and I emailed Joel Nielsen hoping for a reply. And he actually got back to me! That's, fucking, that's what you love to see! Apparently the vocals were done by his wife, Kayla Nielsen. So hey, congratulations to the both of you because holy fuck, you guys make for one hell of a power couple when it comes to music. Okay, so we're pausing for a second. This is future editing Vin here. Uh, apparently, Kayla was actually credited on Joel Nielsen's website in the special thanks. He says, a very special thank you to my wife and life gamer, Kayla. This soundtrack would not have been possible without your amazing voice and your patient support. That's my bad. I never noticed that. Uh, I still wish she was credited in the credits of the game because her vocals are so important, but she is credited on his website. Still absolutely huge thanks to Joel for getting back to me on that. This still helped me a ton. I'm just very stupid. After almost an hour of running around, platforming, being chased, and solving puzzles, you get chased by Gonark one final time, and land in a large open room with no way out. This is where the fun truly begins. After an entire level of being chased down by this monster, feeling helpless, you finally have an upper hand. It is a full-on dogfight. You are throwing everything you have at this thing out of desperation because you know what it is capable of. The entire level has conditioned you to feeling fear at even the presence of this thing. All the while, the scientists back in the Lambda Lab are shoveling you more supplies to try and help you take this thing down. You dodge incoming attacks, shoot rockets at her, but she just doesn't want to go down. So you keep shooting, running, and dodging before the floor finally gives way. Gonark grabs onto the ledge, clearly injured from the encounter, until she falls helplessly down into the hole with you. She's limping and clearly injured, but at this point in the fight, you're out of rockets and energy ammo and fucking everything else, so you're using weaker weapons like the shotgun and MP5 to whittle her down. So you keep dodging and shooting and fighting and dodging and shooting and fighting and dodging and shooting and fighting, and at last, she dies. Yeah, if I haven't made it clear by my tone here, this is one of my favorite boss fights of, of all time. Genuinely. The pacing of this entire section is just too fucking good. Having you chased by this larger than life monster for almost an hour before giving you one last spectacle where you take it out in a gruesome fight is the type of shit that makes video games a truly special art form in my eyes. And while all this is going on, the song Internal Conflict is just fucking making love to your ears throughout the entire fight. This right here is how you do a boss fight in a first person shooter, and it's fucking awesome to see the potential that this fight had in the original game fully realized here. 
Even while writing the script right now, re-watching this fight on my right monitor for reference, it's just making me want to stop what I'm doing and just replay this entire fucking game. It's so good! So let's just move on to Interloper before I lose my goddamn mind even more. Now, I know throughout this entire video, I've relentlessly dogpiled on the original Half-Life for how terrible the Zen levels are. And yeah, they're really bad. With that said, however, I honestly think that they would have been remembered with a lot less reverence if not for this right here. Is reverence the right word? I don't think reverence is... Hold on. Oh, no, not reverence. Holy shit, not reverence. Reverence, <laughs> that's the complete wrong word. Uh, disdain. Yeah, disdain. That's, that's another fucking pretentious word. With that said, however, I honestly think that they would have been remembered with a lot less disdain if not for this level right here, Interloper. In essence, it's supposed to be the climax of everything we've seen throughout the entire game. We've been to the outskirts of Zen and seen the wildlife and scenery, and now we are in the more industrial areas with factories and Vortigaunt slaves. However, these themes are in service for some of the worst level design and enemy placements I have ever seen in any game. It is just one giant maze that keeps going on and on and on with these little flying fucks that are easily the worst enemy in the game. It's the shittiest kind of level where it's not necessarily too hard to play through, instead it's mainly just confusing and tedious to traverse. It takes like 30 minutes to get through, but it always feels like an hour on repeat playthroughs. It's probably the only level in the game that even now, I can't clearly map out in my head, and that just sucks! They also ruined the Vortigaunt Slave twist by not properly distinguishing which Vorts are going to attack you and which are docile. Playing this as a child, I honestly just thought that some of the Vorts were bugged in this area. Not that they were secretly being controlled by a giant alien overlord. It's a shame too, because I really do love this twist and it's a major plot point for the entire rest of the series. If you didn't pick up on this easy to miss story beat, then you are going to be very fucking confused in future games where the Vortigaunts are suddenly helping and even worshiping you. Oh, <sighs> okay, I've been meaning to do that for years. I, I hate Interloper. God, it sucks. That, like, I, that got a lot off my chest. Now with that giant ass rant out of the way, how does Interloper fare in Black Mesa? From what I've seen online, it's incredibly easy to say that Interloper is still the most controversial element of Zen. But, for myself personally, I fucking adore this level, and we will be going into extensive detail on why. Probably too much detail to be honest, but I do understand why some may not be the most thrilled to find that they took an already overly long level in the original game and basically doubled its length for the remake. So for this section, I will be bringing up a couple of the core complaints that I've heard from people online, and I'll explain why my personal view on the level differs so much. So you start off this area with an absolutely gorgeous view of the main factory. Like I said earlier in this video, I, I can just not stress enough how good of a gameplay motivator this thing is. Seeing it constantly getting larger and larger as you inch your way closer and closer just never gets old to me. It also helps that as you get closer, the sky begins to get entrenched in smog and smoke. It's a nice way to show just how much Nihalant's control has begun to take its toll in the ecosystem. Anyways, you start out the level by approaching this large complex that turns out to be a Vortigaunt concentration camp. You sneak your way in and find a couple of alien grunts beating and torturing defensive Vortigaunts. So, you do what any sane and rational person does. The thing I really like about this moment is that unlike in the original game, you instantly understand what is happening and that the Vortigaunts are being forced into slavery. Now I have seen some argue that the section is a little bit of an overcorrection and that the original game handled it with a bit more subtlety, but you know, two things with that. First, I don't think a fascist regime hell-bent on taking over other planets and galaxies knows really anything about the word subtle. And secondly, I would rather have the game be blunt about what is going on rather than be so subtle 
that 90% of players think the game is bugged when it's actually trying to tell a cool story. I think most completely new players by the end of this section will understand that Vortigons are being forced into work, and those players will now be even more motivated to stop their oppressors. And of course, if they don't understand it by the end of this section, they will with this next part. As you go deeper into the camp, you suddenly come across this force field that impedes your path forward. The worker Vortigons notice you and with hesitation decide to let you into the camp. I absolutely adore this part because it's an excellent little piece of quiet time. You can explore and interact with all the Vorts working, and you can even see the one who let you in talking to his friend. It's a fantastic change of pace that really helps you relate to these guys. I imagine if you played this for the first time, this right here would be the moment where you would reflect and realize that the hundreds of Vorts that you killed on the way to get here were all actually victims. This is the cool shit that the first game wanted to explore! After all this time of getting to know the Vortigons and understanding the situation you're in, you accidentally trip an alarm within the camp, where you are quickly shown the true horrors of what is happening here. So now, you're left with a pretty interesting choice. You go after the alien controllers first, who are harder to hit, while taking your attention off of the Vortigons shooting at you? Or do you just say fuck it and go the easier route and massacre everyone? I'm not even going to show you that second option, because you are objectively a massive piece of shit if you do that, and I hate you as a person, but it's still pretty cool that the game gives you the freedom to do that. Sometimes the harder option is also the morally correct one, and it's always cool to see that explored in a video game. And with that said, the part of the sequence that really does stick with me is the aftermath. You see the once jovial and friendly Vorts now cowering in fear, scared for their lives. The one that hurts the most is that the Vortigaunt that let you into this place, no matter what you do, is now dead on the floor with his best friend crying over his body. This is where you slowly realize that if it wasn't for you coming into this place, then that guy would still be alive. It's one of the few moments in the entire game where I really did stop and reflect about my actions. It makes you even angrier at Neolant's forces, and even more determined to take down this entire operation. And god damn it, seeing this level of war building and storytelling through gameplay from a fucking fan game that is, is nothing short of an incredible achievement. Now before you finally make it to the main tower and begin your ascent, the game has one more little surprise waiting for you. I don't really have too much new to say about this specific section, since it plays incredibly similar to all the other Gone Arc chase sequences, but I still really like this part. The combination of the music and also realizing that you stumbled into a nest of gargantuas is a really good oh shit moment. I actually completely forgot about this part on my recent playthrough of the game, so it was honestly a nice little treat. Also, I absolutely love this final shot of all the gargantuas looking at you from the distance. But finally, now we enter into easily the most controversial part of this entire level, the Green Gamer Goo Factory. <laughs> One of the largest complaints that this section gets is just how long it is. It just seems to keep going and going and going without any stopping point in sight, just like in the original game. But honestly, that's kind of why I love this section so much. One of the things that I didn't really like about the original Half-Life 2 is that you spend so much of the game staring at this giant tower in the distance, knowing damn well that at some point in this game, you're going to have to climb all the way to the top of that thing. And of course, by the end of the game, you do. The problem, though, is that it doesn't really feel like a climb. You break into the bottom of the Citadel, and then ride a little tram ride that within minutes takes you already halfway up the tower without any input from the player. Then you do a fun little section with the gravity gun, go up a few elevators, and then take another unskippable tram ride up the second half of the tower, which takes you into Breen's office. It doesn't feel like I earned this climb at all! Hell, it barely feels like I even ascended! At one point, I'm on the ground floor, and the next thing you know, I'm at the top of the Citadel doing the final boss! I would honestly say that this is the weakest moment of Half-Life 2, even more than the damn sequence, if not for the supercharged gravity gun just being so much fun to use. 
And as we go through this entire second half of Interloper, you will see that concept actually fully realized here. By the end of this level, you will feel that satisfaction of climbing a giant tower and then some. But starting out on the ground floor, you find yourself around a lot of alien machinery controlled by more docile Vortigons. One part of the factory that I love is that, once again, it just feels so strange and alien. Of course, the familiar sights of infrastructure are there, but everything is just slightly off. Like, what exactly is this green goo that they're pumping? Why is the wall made of flesh stitched together and bleeding? Why can you shoot these little red pimples and flood the room with blood? Is the factory itself alive? Why are the Vortigons so sexy! I can understand if the constant sight of machinery is kind of bland to you, but one of my favorite games of all time is fucking Nier Automata, so I can't get enough of this shit. Give me more larger than life factories. I'll eat it up like the little fucking slob I am. The majority of your time in the factory will be doing light puzzle solving to progress. I like almost all of these puzzles, except the ones that involve plugs. I don't really have a problem with them as a concept. It's more so the fact that the game just uses this puzzle way too fucking much by the end of the game, and I get really sick of it. But all of the other puzzles I think are really fun and unique. Probably my favorite is when you ride on top of the grunt barrels on a conveyor belt, when suddenly it is taken into another room for a strange form of inspection. Giant red lasers shoot out of the wall and you have to dodge them all or else you'll freaking die in real life. Now that joke sucks, I'm not keeping it. Honestly, it's a complete ripoff of the BFG segment in Doom 2016, but hey, I love that section in that game, so I enjoyed it here. Sometimes it's not a bad thing to plagiarize. I'm cool with it. I'm, I'm not gonna be a fucking nerd. So for the first 30 minutes, you're just climbing and climbing, solving puzzles, then more climbing and more climbing. However, one of the things you may be realizing at this point of the game is just how low on ammo you've become. The supply drops from the scientists begin to decrease dramatically. I like this little detail because it also shows that the scientists themselves are also running out of resources at the Lambda Lab. It's a nice way to make you begin to feel desperate, which is perfectly realized in this large grunt fight in the middle of the climb. All of a sudden you're ambushed by like 10 grunts, and you have to get really creative in the ways you deal with them. You have to use precious ammo for your rocket launcher, cow cannon, satchel charges, and at one point I even had to use the hive hand. And let me tell you, no one has ever consciously gone, oh man, I really want to use the hive hand today. <laughs> This section is such a great way to make the player feel the climb even harder. You are at your wit's end, but you still see so much of the climb left. And this is the moment where they introduce the funny crystals. You run into these crystals that begin to shoot green light at you. This is where the game suddenly switches to your gluon gun and shows you that this green energy is powering your weapon. And then all of a sudden, the game spawns multiple alien controllers on you and you are allowed to just unload with this new unlimited ammo mode of the gluon gun. Oh! Oh! Okay, I fucking love everything about this sequence so goddamn much. Let me break down just why into, into small little minuscule parts. For starters, in the original game, I really felt like the Gluon Gun was just a really underutilized weapon. You're introduced to it pretty late in the game, with its ammo much rarer than other ammo types in the game, and it eats up that ammo at an incredibly inefficient rate. While it is technically more powerful than the Tau Cannon, you'll end up using that weapon more purely because of how much it conserves ammo in comparison. In Black Mesa, they didn't really change anything to the Gluon Gun, but now they give you an actual reason to just go wild with it. And guess what? It's still really fucking satisfying to evaporate enemies on the spot. A bet! Credit card! <laughs> The second reason I love this moment is because just like the blue crystals from earlier, it actually explains how the scientists made the gluon gun and the Tau Cannon. They brought back the crystals from Zen and harnessed the energy from them into these weapons. Sure, it was always kind of assumed to have been the case in the original game, but it's still satisfying to see that story element implemented into the world in a better way. It's like turning fan service into a really interesting game mechanic. And most importantly, I love this section because of its pacing. Like I said a moment ago, this is introduced right at the point where the climb is starting to heavily eat away at your resources, and you are beginning to believe it is never going to end. It's at this point they introduce these segments where you feel like an absolute fucking god just mowing through waves of enemies with infinite ammo, and it's so damn satisfying. 
This right here is why I disagree with the criticism that this level is bad because of how long it is. Moments like these show that it's supposed to overstay its welcome. This moment right here and the rest of Interloper for that matter would not have felt even half as good if the climb was shorter. This is the payoff for all the hard work you went through getting to this point, so go wild and have fun. Yeah! <laughs> I did it! So, after this section, you begin your ascent again, but this time with a whole new outlook on your situation. You can just feel yourself getting closer to the end. You're covering larger gaps in the tower in shorter amounts of time due to these launch pads, and you even get a few more instances where you get to go all out on some enemies with a gluon gun. I'm actually going to play one of those for you right here unedited, so you can just get a feel for how fucking sick this feels. God, I love this game so much. So after all that, you reach this giant elevator. You jump on it, and it slowly begins to ascend. This right here begins your final obstacle before Nihilanth. As the elevator begins to climb, you pass by both blue crystals giving you armor and green crystals giving you infinite ammo, while alien controllers are beginning to pour out from everywhere. This is where the music begins to slowly creep in, starting with a low droning noise as the elevator continues to climb. You can just feel yourself getting closer and closer to your goal. As you ascend, you see these little metal platforms floating around you, and because of your infinite ammo, you instinctively shoot at one, thus finding out that you can actually break them. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the climb, you see the area above you close off. So you quickly jump off onto a nearby platform that is holding these generators surrounded by little metal bits from earlier. So what do you do? Well, what the game was teaching you all along, you fucking shoot it. And after all that, the music begins to slowly ramp back down, and you see in the distance the end of your journey. You're finally at the end of your climb, and just when you think you're home free, this happens.
really wish I had a video of my reaction to the first time this sequence happened because I popped off so fucking hard. You could just feel the desperation coming from this last assault from the alien controllers. Neolinth is fucking sweating. And this is the first time throughout the entire game where you feel truly unstoppable. No longer are you the prey. You're now the motherfucking predator. And Neolinth knows it. This shit is both shameless fan service and also just really amazing storytelling through gameplay. Remember, all of this has been portrayed to the player exclusively through its gameplay. Without taking control away from you once, this one sequence right here is probably my favorite bit of environmental storytelling I've ever seen in a game not called Outer Wilds. After that sequence, you are finally done with Interloper. You go through one last little platforming challenge and reach the top of the tower. In the original Zen, it was basically just a super sick looking portal in a sea of darkness. I actually really like this moment in the original because it kind of feels like you're standing on the edge of oblivion, but Black Mesa still has a beat. I mean, look at the fucking manta rays and, and just God, this music, like calm the fuck on. Music should not be this good. You can actually look around and see all the areas you just came from. With just how high in the sky you are, it should feel like I just spent forever climbing up to this point. But Jesus Christ, my throat is getting so tired from reading the script for almost two fucking hours. So can we just please jump through the portal and get this over with? I'm so tired. I don't think it's possible to fully articulate the excitement I had for this boss my first time playing the game. I mean, the original Neolinth fight in Half-Life is right next to Interloper as one of the most notorious things about the entire series. It fucking sucks. It is a lot like the Gonark fart, fart. <laughs> It's a lot like the Gonark fight, where you just dump all of your rounds into the enemy without much thought or strategy. Well, except destroying the yellow crystals, but like, that's whatever. And here's the thing, that wouldn't really be so bad on its own, but what makes it just the fucking worst is this stupid teleporting attack. It's really nice to see that Neolanth has his favorite fucking move, because he fires it every two fucking seconds, and it leads to the same three platforming challenges that are all super easy. It's such a wet fart to end the game on, but a perfect encapsulation of everything wrong with Zen. Cool in concept, but boring, bland, and tedious in execution. But with everything I had played of Black Mesa Zen up until that point, I was so fucking excited to see what exactly the devs had in store for this fight. I mean, just look at what they did with the Gonark fight. Crowbar Collective must be holding back some crazy ass shit for this final fight. Meh. I can take it or leave it. I think I just honestly had my hopes set way too high for what was always going to be a pretty whelming fight, all things considered. Which is kind of weird to say because describing some of the stuff in this fight on paper sounds so cool. You're fighting a giant eldritch baby god while he teleports in bits of Black Mesa itself and chucks them at you while raining hellfire down from above. That sounds fucking awesome! I don't know, man. After everything else that happened in this game, I was expecting a bit more. I mean, there's strangely no music for this fight, which I feel is a huge mistake. That combined with just how easy and short this battle was, even with the added shields around it for protection, I just feel like they could have done a bit more. Maybe add another phase where you platform around chasing him while he runs away. No, no, that's, no that sounds stupid. That sounds fucking stupid. <laughs> but I could make a better fight than you. <laughs> But yeah, it's it's really no big deal. I still like the fight and find it to be a good send off to the game, but I just feel it could have been a bit more. And of course, once you finish them off, you get to see the entire factory and Neolon's lair explode from the distance. And that's Black Mesa Zen. You know, 
When I replayed this game for this video, it for some reason felt super surreal. I don't know what exactly it is, but I've played through literally hundreds of Half-Life 2 mods throughout my years, and even all the way through Valve's official Half-Life Alex. And I don't think any of that stuff is nearly as good as Black Mesa Zen. I think it's honestly really telling that the worst parts of Black Mesa to me were when it was just going through the motions of Half-Life 1. And the best parts were when Crowbar Collective threw their own ideas and little touches into the game to make something brand new. I really do think Black Mesa itself is one of the better remakes of a game that exists, but I almost don't want it to be a remake. You know, like seeing revamp set pieces and areas like the cliffside or blast pit were really nice, but that stuff didn't really stick with me long after finishing the game. But you know what I do remember? The new set piece at the end of Questionable Ethics, or the revamped Gonark fight, or the new tree sequence, and of course that incredible elevator ride. I've mentioned multiple times throughout this video that I actually sat down and wrote notes about my thoughts with the game while I went through it. It's the first time I've ever done that and God damn it, I'm proud of it. With that said, the one thing I noticed is that while I needed to rely on my notes heavily while writing about the base game, I barely fucking looked at these notes while writing the segments about Zen. And guess what? I still covered all of what I wanted to say about this portion of the game. I guess what I'm trying to say here in this long and rambly end of the video is that while I adore Black Mesa as a remake, I think Crowbar Collective has the potential to make something so much more. They use the bones of Half-Life 1 to get their company off the ground, and for that I am eternally grateful. But Valve, please get these guys on an official fucking new Half-Life game! I'm not saying you should give them the keys to Half-Life 3, but instead give them a project like Alex, a nice little side story in the Half-Life universe that isn't centered around Gordon Freeman. And you know who should be the main character? FUCKING ADRIAN SHEPARD! You have this beloved character that is just sitting in the Valve vault rotting away! Why don't you just give him over to Crowbar Collective to make a small game with him in the driver's seat? Crowbar Collective is clearly a group of people that are passionate about the Half-Life series, who know how to make a good fucking video game. They have shown me and everyone else that when they are given the freedom to do what they want without the restrictions of any prior game, they are able to make something truly fucking incredible. Let these guys make the next Half-Life spinoff game, and I guarantee you it will be a fucking banger. So if anyone from Crowbar Collective is watching this video, I just want to say congratulations. Congrats on beating Valve at their own fucking game. Normally that's uh, where I would end the video, uh, but I kept promising people that this video would be an hour long, the hour long Vinny Super G special. Uh, and it's only 57 minutes in this timeline. And that just won't fucking do. That just, that just will not do. So does this ruin the, the heartfelt and beautiful, frankly beautiful ending of this video? Absolutely. Do I care? No. <laughs> no. I want this to be an hour, damn it. So let's just, you know, I'm here. Let's just talk. Let's just talk. Uh, uh, did you guys like that? <laughs> did you guys like the, did you guys like the video? Yeah, I, I, hey, listen, I, I spent probably 300, 400 hours total on this video. I originally had this script written and voiced last summer. <laughs> I fucking recorded all of this, uh, the footage you see, I, I, uh, did all the voice work, I did all the script work, and then, over the course of a year, I just had so much shit just pile on. I mean, cause, I graduated in that time, so I had to deal with, like, my senior project, and just, like, a lot of stuff regarding with that. Client work basically doubled for me, so I was doing... A shit ton more work for people like Jerma. I started working for like Quentin Reviews. I'm still doing like Josh work, Wubby work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I've been just bouncing around, doing a lot of different shit like that. Um, I mean, if you've if you're a fan of Second Jerma, you can see that I literally am now like a co-manager of that fucking channel. <laughs> so that takes that takes a lot of my time. I I just kind of wanted to sit here and say like thanks for taking like like 
thanks for just being like cool <laughs> with me taking this this massive time to do something that uh, I'm frankly very proud of. As I'm sitting here, I have the rough cut of the video done. There's a few sections I still need to clean up and tweak, but uh, I'm expecting to get this video out by the time I'm recording this within the next couple of days. This is kind of gonna be like a mini update, but I think for the future, of what I want to do with the channel. I don't think making a video of this scale again in the near future is sustainable because it would just take a long fucking time and especially with, I, I have a lot of shit going on. Uh, but I obviously still want to keep making videos. I think the plan is, is I have one video that uh, I don't think is in the same scale as this one that I really want to do, but I can see it getting out of control. So I'm a bit worried. I think I about like just jumping into that one, but I guarantee you, you guys are going to see that video because that's like, if I quit the channel, this video has to be made before I quit the channel. <laughs> like I want to do this video so fucking bad. I will give you a hint. It's about a movie. Uh, it is a movie video. Um, but I have so much I want to say about this movie. It's also one that I haven't seen anyone else talk about on the platform. Uh, so I'm very, very interested to talk about that. I also have, um, some, some other ideas for smaller projects. Um, and, and if, if you made it this far, I want to ask you a question, like a genuine, sincere question. Did you like my channel awesome video? Like, like about, about the channel awesome movies. And would you like to see more in that style? And what I mean by that is I have a lot of video ideas that I would just like to kind of rant about. Like, like just, just unscripted, like what I'm doing now, just rant to my computer monitor and to you guys about a random topic, and then I clean it up in, in the audio and I do some light editing. Would you guys like that? Because I have some ideas in mind for some videos like that that I think could be really, really fun, and it would be a lot quicker than waiting a full year for another big Black Mesa extravaganza that you're kind of experiencing now. If that sounds interesting, please let me know. Um, I, I work insanely, insanely hard on these videos and this next movie video that I'm, I'm talking about, I like, I, I am making that and I do want to make it. I just, I don't want you guys to wait another full fucking year for another video. So if you guys are interested in that, please let me know. I still want my next video to probably be a smaller, more concise video than something as like an hour long fucking editing extravaganza. Cause like I said, this took probably over 400, 500. I stopped tracking. I, tr I usually track all my hours on the work I do. Uh, I stopped tracking after 200 hours and that was a couple months ago. So, <laughs> so it was probably, it was probably like at least 400 ish hours, but this has gone on long enough. I have officially passed the one hour mark. Um, I would just like to end this video by saying I meant everything I said uh, about Black Mesa Zen and Black Mesa. I truly think this is one of my favorite remakes slash games, um, especially Black Mesa Zen. And it's very telling that even after a year with all this stuff and th constantly thinking about the game, I still stand by the general thesis that this game is something special. And I really do think these fucking insanely talented devs at Crowbar Collective could do something so special if just given the reins on like a little small side project. I really do stand by that. Um, and that, that was kind of the driving force for me to even make this video because I wanted to get that point across. These are some talented fucking fucking people. I don't know why I said fucking twice, but they're talented. And I really, really, really do believe that they could make something special if given the chance. Um, and I was worried that something like that would get announced before this video goes up, but it hasn't. So, may I be the change you want to see, motherfucker. Thank you seriously so, 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 so much for watching this. Uh, maybe I'll put like a funny edit here. Maybe I'll put like a funny, like explosion and like, whoa, we ended the video crazy. You gotta watch this for the crazy edit.